An appeal to authority says that an argument is probably good or bad, or a claim is probably true or false, because an authority says so. The authority in question is often a person, but it can also be a book, or a website, or an institution. What makes it an appeal to authority is that the justification for the inference rests primarily on the authority of the source. Not all appeals to authority are fallacious. The trick is to figure out when they are and when they aren't. Here's an appeal to authority. Two kids are talking about life on other planets, and one reports that his dad says that Venus is too hot to have life on it. The other kid is dismissive. He says, so what does he know? The first kid responds that his dad is a planetary scientist who works for NASA. Assuming that he's not lying and his dad really is a planetary scientist, this looks like it could be a good appeal to authority. On the other hand, if he'd said this, oh, my dad looked it up on a website, then the argument wouldn't be as convincing. Now the claim rests on the authority of a nameless website. Without anything else to go on, this is a bad argument since we don't know anything about the reliability of the website. It could be right. The internet is full of reliable information, but it's also full of false information and crackpot sites. The World Wide Web as a collective body can't be treated as a reliable authority on anything. Every appeal to authority relies on a claim like the following. Anything, or almost anything, that authority A says about subject matter S is true, or probably true. An appeal to authority is good just in case a claim of this sort can be plausibly defended. If it's true, then you can use a claim like this as a premise and use it to infer the truth of claims about S, the subject matter in question. On the other hand, if we don't have good reason to think the claim is true, then it's a bad appeal to authority and guilty of a fallacy. So our planetary scientist example might look like this. Almost everything that a planetary scientist says about the conditions necessary for life to exist on a planet are probably true. James is a planetary scientist. James says that Venus is most likely too hot for life to exist. Therefore, we can conclude that Venus is most likely too hot for life to exist. Now, the conclusion follows. The logic is fine. The only question is whether that first premise that makes the authority claim is plausible or not. If we think it's plausible, then we should judge the argument to be good. If we don't, then we should judge it bad, that it's a fallacious appeal to authority. Unfortunately, there's no easy rule for judging authority claims. It rests entirely on our background knowledge. To judge this claim, we have to know something about what planetary scientists do, what their area of expertise is, how close the claim in question is to their area of expertise, and so on. In this case, my first reaction is that a planetary scientist is a very good authority on this kind of question. It seems right up their alley. I've had students challenge this example, though. They think that the term life is too broad, and they'd want to restrict the authority claim of a scientist to life as we know it. Maybe organic life as we know it can't exist on Venus. But maybe there are other kinds of living things that could evolve or survive on Venus. Maybe non-organic life forms that operate on very different physical principles than organic life on Earth does. A planetary scientist isn't necessarily an expert on all possible forms of life. Maybe no one is an expert on this. So they would reject premise one as it stands, but they would accept an amended form of the argument like this, where we've restricted the claim at issue to life as we know it. Now they say we have a good appeal to authority. Well, I'll buy this. This sounds like a reasonable amendment to the original argument. And it illustrates nicely the kind of thinking you might have to do when evaluating appeals to authority. You really have to think hard about whether the proposed authority really has relevant expertise on the matter in question. In lots of cases, the answer is obvious. My daughter's 11-year-old friend isn't going to be a reliable authority on quantum field theory. But she may well be an authority on who the popular and unpopular kids are in her class at school. In other cases, the judgment isn't so obvious, and people's initial reactions may differ. Here's an example where the claim at issue is what happens to us after we die. When the Pope makes a claim about this, how should we judge his authority on the matter? Well, a devout Catholic may well treat the Pope as an authority on such things, and they would judge the argument to be good. But you might find that even among practicing Catholics, there's disagreement about what kind of authority the Pope really has. 
And certainly among non-Catholics and atheists, you're not likely to find many who take the Pope to be an authority on the afterlife. Many might question whether anyone could be an authority on a question like this. And this just highlights a fact that we discussed in the very first tutorial course on basic logical concepts, that judgments about the plausibility or implausibility of premises can vary from audience to audience, depending on the background assumptions that, that different audiences bring to the table. There's no getting around it, and appeals to authority are particularly sensitive to this kind of variation. So, to sum up, appeals to authority rest on claims that assert that everything, or almost everything, that A says about S is true, or probably true. This is the authority claim. An appeal to authority is good when the authority claim is plausible. It's fallacious when the authority claim is not plausible. Also, judgments about the plausibility of authority claims are sensitive to differences in the experience and background of different audiences. One audience might recognize A as an authority on a subject, while another audience might reject A or at least be skeptical about A as an authority. In cases like this, if you want to pursue an appeal to authority, then you'll need additional argumentation to defend the authority claim. Now let me make a final comment about appeals to authority that you might encounter if you browse other sources on fallacies. You'll commonly find people saying that certain kinds of appeals to authority are always fallacious. Probably the most common example is about the authority of claims about a commercial product coming from the lips of a paid spokesperson for the product. Many sources will tell you that you should always treat celebrity endorsements, for example, as fallacious appeals to authority, since these people are being paid for their endorsement, so they have a motive to be biased, and on top of that, they probably don't have any special expertise in the pros and cons of the product in question as compared to rival products on the market. My response is that this is good advice as far as it goes. But I can't see a rationale for turning this into an absolute rule. Sometimes paid spokespersons are very well informed about the pros and cons of a product, and sometimes they really are good authorities on the subject matter. Yes, a paid endorsement introduces concerns about bias that an unpaid endorsement avoids, but I prefer to treat this as just one of many factors that people have to take into consideration when evaluating appeals to authority. For any appeal to authority, you should always be asking questions like, is the source biased? Or is there some reason to mislead? How does the source's claim compare with expert opinion on the subject? Is the claim plausible or implausible on its face? Is the source being cited correctly or is the claim being taken out of context? You need to consider many factors when judging appeals to authority.